Today we're going to cover chapter 2, which is Principles of Physical Fitness. Actually, this chapter is going to be the foundation of all the uh, material that I'm going to cover for this uh, portion of this class, 163. So I would really like you to understand the material within this chapter clearly so that we can go deeper into every single item that is covered in this chapter in the other upcoming chapters individually. So the outline for this chapter is um, we're going to look at the physical activity versus exercise and define them, be able to give examples. And then the most important thing, which I also mentioned in the first Zoom meeting with you guys, is going to be the health-related components of physical fitness. Again, I'm emphasizing this, that this is going to be the foundation, all those components being uh, individual chapters of this course. Then we will look at skill-related components of physical fitness, and then the training principles, and uh, probably cover some review questions. Okay, so what is, the, uh, what is the difference between physical activity versus exercise? So as you can see from the uh, description of what physical activity is, it's a, a random movement, okay, which um, is carried out by your skeletal muscles, your body, and it moves or it requires some energy. It uses up energy from your system but it's not scheduled or structured. It is just a physical activity that you go through every single day in your life. And it is important, and it, it also uh, constitutes a big portion, big chunk in the research field uh, in our exercise physiology uh, discipline. And it is very important to understand the importance of physical activity and health. And then um, when we look at exercise, it is a planned, structured, repetitive movement, and it is intended to specifically improve or maintain physical fitness. And we will cover what physical fitness is and how we can develop training programs to improve our physical fitness. Okay, so um, the reports state that physical activity benefits people of all ages and of all racial and ethnic groups, including people with disabilities. So the benefits of physical activity that you see on this slide are not limited to just one uh, kind of population or one age group. It is available for everyone, including people with disabilities. The reports emphasize that the benefits of activity outweigh the danger. So yes, physical activity or exercise, we know that it is a stress to the body, but the reports show us that the benefits will outweigh the danger. So you can read for yourself what the benefits of physical activity are, but mainly it's going to protect us from the risks of dying prematurely, dying from any chronic diseases such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and it will help reduce the blood pressure if you started off with a high blood pressure. And some cancers uh, will, the risk of having some cancers will be reduced by regular physical activity, including colon cancer. And also, of course, we will feel better it will reduce the feelings of depression and anxiety. It will increase our well-being, psychological well-being, emotional wellness, and physical wellness. Okay, so increasing physical activity. We now know that there are many benefits coming from increasing physical activity in our lives. I'm not talking about just exercise, but in general, any movement that we can incorporate into our lifestyles. And these are the guidelines that I would like you to remember. Okay, For substantial health benefits, if we want to see the health benefits coming from increasing physical activity, 
we should be doing 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity. And I will cover what those are. So 150 minutes per week is equal to 2 hours and 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity per week, not daily. So we can totally uh, split that those minutes into multiple days. And if we were to do vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity, the recommendations say that we should be doing it for 75 minutes per week. So these daily totals can be accumulated in multiple bouts of 10 or more minutes per day. For example, two 10-minute bike rides to and from class and a brisk 10-minute walk to the store. All you need to do is to keep track of what you have been doing uh, so far into the day and then try to make sense of how many minutes you accumulated during the day so that they, if they can make up to 150 minutes per day because they're moderate intensity aerobic physical activities. So in this lifestyle approach to physical activity, people can choose activities that they find enjoyable and that, they, that fit into their daily routine, which is very important to understand. Everyday tasks at school, work, home can be structured to contribute to the daily activity total. And if Americans who are currently sedentary were to increase their lifestyle physical activity to 30 minutes per day, both public health and their individual well-being would benefit enormously. So these are, on the left-hand side, when it says 150 minutes per week, that table shows you kinds of exercises uh, or activities that you can do for um, fulfilling the requirement for the moderate intensity uh, physical activity. And if you look at the examples, you can see that walking at moderate pace, walking to school, to work, or walking for pleasure, um, yoga, weight training, bodybuilding, horseback riding, bicycling, fly fishing, golf, those are all considered moderate intensity exercise or physical activity. And if you look at the right hand side table, that is telling you 75 minutes per week and the kinds of activities that you can do are aerobic dancing, you can follow videos right now while you're staying home, high impact aerobic, there's many, many available on YouTube. Um, Again, if you want recommendations, I will always uh, point you to the right direction. Jogging, you can still go outside and, you know, keep your social distance from others and do your jogging. And soccer, um, circuit weight training, uh, which is what I teach for my body sculpting class. Again, you are more than welcome to ask for my um, pre-designed workout programs for that class so that you can do it at home. Well, if weight management is a concern for you, that means if you are trying to lose some weight, we, we need to begin slowly and gradually and um, maybe having a goal of completing 30 minutes of activity per day and then try to raise your activity level further to 60 to 90 minutes per day or more. This is what uh, the recommendations are if you are looking to lose weight, 60 to 90 minutes per day of physical activity. Again, it is physical activity. It includes everything that you do at home, cleaning, gardening, um, even cooking, um, squatting to reach for something to pick up from the floor. Uh, but for even better health and well-being, you need to participate in a structured exercise program that develops physical fitness at the same time. Any increase in physical activity will contribute to your health and well-being now in the short term and in the long term in the future. It's an investment for your health. Now, we need to talk about the definition of physical fitness. If you can see from the slide, 
This definition comes from 1979 and it is still valid. It is the definition of physical fitness is the capability of your heart, the blood vessels, lungs, and muscles to function at optimal efficiency. So from looking at this definition, you need to understand what organ systems contribute to this physical fitness. And it's mainly your circulation, which is responsible for delivering the needed oxygen from the air into your muscles and, of course, your muscular skeletal system to create the movement. Um, there are a set of physical attributes that allows the body to respond or adapt to the demands and stresses of physical effort. And to perform moderate to vigorous levels of physical activity without becoming overly tired is also another definition of physical fitness. Levels of fitness depend on such physiological factors as the heart's ability to pump blood, like we talked about, and the energy generating capacity of the cells, which is going to be the chapter 3, where we're going to discuss how our bodies generate that energy and use it at the same time. So what factors would be the determinants of the level of physical fitness that your body has? Uh, of course, genetics, a person's inborn potential for physical fitness is a main factor, and also behavior. So you can't just say, my genetics are not designed to be a fit person. You can change this by, again, behavior changes that we talked about in the first chapter, getting enough physical activity to stress the body and cause long-term physiological changes. There are five components of physical fitness, and these are health-related components. And again, I'm going to focus on the importance of understanding these individually because they're going to constitute a chapter in your book, each one of them. We, we need to understand every single one of them, and it, we need to understand five of them being the components of health-related physical fitness. So... Um, cardiorespiratory endurance is the first one, is the most, and also the most important one. The muscular strength, muscular endurance, flexibility, and body composition. And I'm going to repeat this again. Within these five, there is one that is the most important for your health and vitality, and it should be in everyone's smart goals to improve it with no further questions, and that is your cardiorespiratory endurance or cardiorespiratory fitness. So what, what is it? It is the ability to perform prolonged, large muscle, and dynamic exercises at moderate to high intensities because it is, the, it is also the indication of the efficiency of oxygen transport. Where am I transporting this oxygen to and from? I'm, ox I'm transporting this oxygen from the atmosphere, which is available in the atmosphere. 21% of the air is oxygen. And I'm taking that into my body and um, delivering it to the muscle cell so that I can produce enough energy to function further. So it is the central component of health-related fitness because heart and lung function is so essential to overall good health. A person can't live very long or very well without a heart, healthy heart or healthy lungs. So poor cardiorespiratory fitness is linked with heart disease, type 2 diabetes, colon cancer, stroke, depression, and anxiety. When it is low, your endurance is low, cardiorespiratory endurance is low, the heart has to work harder during normal daily activities and may not be able to uh, work hard enough to sustain high-intensity physical activity in an emergency situation like we talked about yesterday when we covered for the first chapter, like, uh, uh, for example, an earthquake or... Uh, anything that you can think of as emergency. 
A healthy heart can better withstand the strains of everyday life, the stress of occasional emergencies, and the regular wear and tear of time. So, if you were to choose to do the extra credit assignment where you design your own uh, training program, you have to have this component embedded or designed into your training program. This is not optional. Okay, the second component is muscle strength. This is the mi maximal force that a muscle can exert. Another definition is the amount of force a muscle can produce with a single maximum effort. So it is basically the strength of your muscles and it's frequently measured as one repetition max or one RM. So it is specific to the exercise that you're doing and it is the load that we're talking about. So if you're talking about a squat exercise or the bent over row exercise, as you see in the picture, we're talking about a single maximum effort and we're measuring the amount of load or weight in pounds or kilograms that you can do with only one repetition. That's going to show your strength for that specific exercise. Muscle endurance, however, is not the same as muscular strength. It is the ability to resist fatigue, okay, and sustain a given level of muscle tension. What does that mean? It is to hold a muscle contraction for a long time or to contract a muscle over and over and over again. Those are called repetitions. So ability to continue submaximal. We're not talking about maximum effort here. It is sub meaning below. Below your maximal capacity, it is a submaximal contraction, but we're talking about the ability to sustain those contractions for many times or for a long amount of time. So if you look at this picture given on the slide, She's holding a plank position or a push-up position and sustaining that submaximal contraction, which this picture does not show you the maximum effort. It is submaximal and it is the uh, resistance to fatigue. It is important for good posture, okay, and, and for injury prevention. Let's say if your abdominal and back muscles cannot support and stabilize your spine correctly when you sit or stand for long periods, which is very relevant for now, the chances of low back pain and back injury are increased. So good muscular endurance in the trunk muscles is more important than muscular strength for preventing back pain. And for general population, having muscular endurance in your uh, training program as one of the SMART goals is recommended over having muscular strength. So muscular endurance will help people cope with daily physical demands and enhances performance in sports and work. So working to improve muscular endurance also brings about cardiovascular benefits due to the nature of the workouts with many repetitions with little or no rest. The third component of health-related fitness is flexibility. It is the ability to move your joints through their full ranges of motion. This is important, guys, even though we're going to cover this in much more detail uh, in the respective chapter. Um, but I want you to now understand that this is specific to the joint. There is no such thing as one person person being flexible or not. That is totally dependent on your joint health in question. So pain-free joints are very important for good health and well-being. And inactivity causes the joints to become stiffer with age. We know that. And stiffness, in turn, often causes people to assume unnatural body postures that can stress joints and muscles. So we need to emphasize the importance of having stretching exercises daily to help ensure a healthy range of motion for all major joints in the body.
So if you look at the picture on the right hand side, the guy is in a bent, bent forward position, which is stretching his spine and mainly lower back joints. On the left hand, say, hand picture, a, a woman is stretching her shoulder joint. So it is totally specific to the given joint. The fifth one is the body composition. This is the last one of the five components. And the definition of it is the proportion of fat and fat-free mass. Fat-free mass includes muscle, bone, and water in your body. So we're looking at how proportion, uh, proportionate of those two different uh, tissues or two main components um, in your body. So if you look at the picture, the yellow one is a five pound mus fat and uh, the red one uh, apparently is a five pound um, muscle. They weigh the same, but if you look at, if you pay attention to it, fat takes up much more space than muscle. Muscle is a dense tissue. Fat is a very less dense tissue. It's even less dense than the water. So when you put fat in the water, it's going to be floating. This slide, uh, the left-hand si left side uh, picture shows you a healthy body composition in a male body and a female body. Um, we're going to cover this in much more detail um, in the respective chapter, but this is how it's supposed to be. Uh, at least we have to have some fat to be able to go through some functions in the body, which we're going to cover in that chapter. And in the right-hand side picture, you will see those two men weighing the same. Look at their weight, 250 pounds, but their composition is mainly different. Again, another picture for you to appreciate how body composition makes a big difference in your health and your physical appearance. Um, as you can see, those women weigh the same, 150 pounds, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 women weighing the same but looking totally uh, different and wearing different sizes of clothing because of their different body compositions. Another slide showing you the differences between um, body compositions with having the same weight. Some of them are the same people and um, they changed after a training program even though they didn't change their body weight that they see on the scale. This is the most important thing what, that you need to understand from this uh, topic. We should not be focusing on lowering body weight too much if we want to change body composition. Lowering the unhealthy body fat and increasing the lean muscle mass, mainly your muscle, uh, lean body mass, excuse me, mainly your, mainly your muscle tissue. So those five components that we covered were health related. Now we're going to focus our attention to skill related or in other words, neuromuscular components of physical fitness. So the ability to perform a particular sport or activity may depend on skill, okay? And skill is totally related to your neuromuscular abilities or neuromuscular functioning. Neuromuscular refers to the complex control of muscles and movement by the brain and spinal cord because they are the, the part of the nervous system that control the, the, uh, the command that comes down to your muscles to create movement. We're going to cover this in the muscular uh, strength and endurance chapter as well. There are particularly two distinct, distinct populations who can benefit greatly by improved skill-related fitness, as you can see from the pictures, and I would like you to remember this. The first population is the athletes, of course, speed, power, agility, balance, coordination, reaction, reaction and movement time are all related to how you will uh, perform in a given sport. But the other one is the older individuals because skill-related activities are particularly important for them. 
to help prevent life-threatening falls. When they fall and break a bone, especially at their hip joint, they will have a hard time and the, the, the likelihood is really low to heal that bone. So they will be bound to bed for the rest of their lives and then they will develop pneumonia and that's going to end up um, killing you in bed. That's why it is very critical and crucial to improve these uh, skill-related components of physical fitness in older individuals. Okay, so what is physical training? There are principles that the training concept is um, founded on, and we will cover them in the next slides to come. But let's understand the fact that human body is very adaptable. Yes, physical training or exercise is a stress to the body and it demands adaptations. But we are hoping to gain positive adaptations uh, with the, the training program that we design uh, for ourselves. So the greater the demands made on the body, the more it adjusts to meet those demands. That's what the growth is, right? If you look at the picture on the right, at the bottom, the, the little kid is growing to become bigger, stronger, and more functional through exercise. And that is also true for adults. Over time, immediate and short-term adjustments Adaptations translate into long-term changes and improvement, and hopefully they're going to be permanent. The goal of physical training is to produce these long-term changes and improvements in the body's functioning and fitness. So what are those training principles? Those are adaptation, or also called training effect, specificity, progressive overload, and reversibility. A well-rounded exercise program includes exercises geared to each component of fitness, to different parts of the body, and to specific activities or sports utilizing the training principles. Okay, let's look at the adaptation principle. All of our exercise physiology science is founded or established on the fact that body responds or adapts to regular exercise by developing more strength, endurance, and flexibility. That's why we do all those exercises to, get, to gain positive adaptation in the body. Body will adapt to the demand and the adaptation occurs. This is important. I want you to listen very carefully. The adaptation does not occur during your training sessions. However, it happens between your training sessions. So your adequate recovery time is needed between your sessions. When you look at aerobic exercises or uh, cardiovascular exercises, cardio, you need to take a day or a, at least 18 hours between your sessions. And when you look at strength, training exercises or sessions, you need to take two days between you train the same muscle groups in the body. That's why bodybuilders split their body uh, into parts to train them, to be able to train them every day. Okay, the specificity um, says, says that, this is another principle of training, um, physical training, it says that a particular, to develop a particular fitness component, you must perform exercises designed specifically for that component. So if you want to improve your cardiovascular fitness, you need to do cardiovascular fitness exercises. So the training adaptations that you see in the body will be specific to the imposed demands or the training that you do. There is, this is an example. Weight training develops muscular strength, but it is less effective for developing cardiorespiratory endurance or flexibility. The third one is the progressive overload. We all know that if we keep doing the same program over and over again, 
and with a given time period or given repetitions with the same amount of weight, we won't be improving anything but maintain. So if we want to improve, we need to apply overload to a specific, of course, it should be um, to a specific level where it doesn't break down the whole system. Progressive means gradual, so it has to be uh, just enough to impose the demands to create adaptations in the body. So too little exercise will have no effect on improving fitness, uh, but maybe will be good for improving your health. And too much exercise, if your body is not ready for it, it's going to bring about the risk of injury and weaken immune system. So the threshold, uh, there is a threshold in the body and it's very individual. That's why it's in red, highly individual. So you cannot be copying an exercise program that was designed for somebody else, okay, for your own um, benefit. It is a highly individual response, and you need to be paying close attention to your, uh, your body's responses to the, the demands that you put on it. The amount of overload uh, needed to maintain, like we talked about, or improve uh, a particular level of fitness for a particular fitness component is determined through four dimensions, and that's represented by the acronym FIT, which we will be using for all the chapters uh, ahead of us. So the FIT uh, says frequency, intensity, time, and type. So the overload that we're going to define, or the exercise program that we're going to uh, prescribe, will have these four variables. How often we're going to do it will indicate the frequency of the, the exercise. How hard we're going to do it, which is the intensity of the exercise, which can be described as in a in, in number of repetitions or time duration when it comes to cardiovascular activities or flexibility. Time is how long of the session, not for a, a specific exercise, but it's for a specific workout belt or a session during the week. And then the type. What is the mode of activity? What am I trying to improve? Again, that comes from the specificity exercise training principle. Ways to overload. Um, if you feel like you are adapted to the specific to a specific level of exercise program you have the option of increasing frequency intensity or time maintaining and versus gaining fitness like we talked about if we keep doing the same thing over and over again we can only maintain the fitness level that we already have but we won't gain any more than that so uh, if we want to increase or improve our fitness level, we should imp in introduce that progressive overload concept to our training programs. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit. So the, the responses will be individual and adaptations will depend on many factors like your age, your gender, uh, females being slower into uh, responding, uh, genetics, your genes, maybe determining the level of testosterone in the body, which is an anabolic hormone, which makes new muscle tissue in the body. That's just one example. Um, the initial fitness level. Initial fitness level is very important. If you start off being sedentary, you're going to see you're going to have more radical responses to the, the training program that you just started doing. Body type, again, uh, we're going to talk about this in the body composition chapter, but the, the type of your physique will also determine your responses. And of course, your the what you put in your body, what you ingest, and that is also called nutrition or diet. 
like we said, the lower the initial level of your fitness, the larger the response will be. And genes influence body fat, strength, and endurance. Um, and gender differences in strength and muscle mass development is also another uh, individual response factor. Okay, the fourth training pr principle is reversibility. Fitness is a reversible adaptation. So it's not going to be permanent. If you start, stop doing your training program, you will start seeing the losses. Cardiorespiratory adaptations are the ones that are lost quickly, within days or weeks. But the strength adaptations that you already gained through your training program are more resistant. And you can just maintain your strength level by maintaining the level of physical activity or exercise just once a week. If you were to keep just one variable stable or the same so that you don't lose so much of your fitness level, that is going to be the intensity. If you maintain your intensity, you can hopefully maintain your fitness level. You can increase, decrease your frequency or duration as long as you maintain the intensity of your training program. Okay, so after covering all the components and the principles, we're going to talk about how we can design our own exercise program. These are the steps that you need to follow, okay, for your own self or if you are training or designing an exercise program for somebody else. The first thing you need to do is to assess the current situation which means you need to know the current level of physical activity and fitness for each of the five health-related fitness components. There are, there are field tests to determine your uh, cardiorespiratory endurance, muscular strength endurance, or muscular endurance flexibility and body composition. And, um, you know, we, we will look into those in the upcoming chapters. But the main thing is to assess your current situation and in your physical fitness level and your physical activity level. The results of these assessment tests will help you set specific fitness goals and plan your fitness program. And set SMART goals like we talked about. Specific, measurable, attainable, re realistic, and time-specific. So the second step is to set up those goals, SMART goals, for each fitness component, okay? All of the five. You don't have to have five fitness components in your training program except for cardiorespiratory fitness as long as you can justify your rationale. Let's say you're going to work toward a three-mile jog or doing 20 push-ups you need to understand what goes into those goals. Um, the third one is choosing those activities for a balanced program. Depending on the results of number one, okay, and your SMART goal, you're going to choose the types, uh, for example, moderate or vig vigorous intensity physical activity or exercises to incorporate based on the fitness component you want to improve. And the, the fourth one is medical clearance or following safety guidelines. So what are those safety guidelines? First, you need to understand what risk category you fall into or the person that you're designing this exercise program for. So if you have two or less cardiovascular risk factors that are listed in your book, that means you are lower moderate risk individual and you can't start moderate intensity without medical clearance right away. But if you have, are in the high risk category, which means there are well-known cardiac, pulmonary or metabolic diseases in your body, you need to have a medical clearance. And there is a PARQ questionnaire in, that's also in your text. It's, it only has seven questions which are answered yes or no. And if you have a yes answer in that questionnaire, you have to get a medical clearance as well. If you are a gym member, 
you might have already filled out that PARQ questionnaire before beginning your gym membership. For some people, however, even though there is going to be medical clearance requested, it is the research already showed us that it is safer to exercise than remain sedentary. And let's say you just started your exercise program. You have to listen to your body. No pain, no gain doesn't work here. Okay. Uh, aches and pains are warning signs of your body to tell you, yeah, hey, you need to stop what you're doing. Uh, you have to take a rest or decrease the intensity. And if you have a severe pain that doesn't go away, you have to seek medical attention. You have to be sensible and not obsessive. This is only one part of your life and you can't take a day off due to any reason. It is going to pick up from where you left and you'll be just fine. This is a long-term commitment, not an immediate um, result. And people who started an exercise program have been shown 50% of it drop off within the first year. That's why you really have to take it easy and increase gradually. Remember the progressive overload principle. You need to hydrate before, during, and after exercise. We're going to cover this again, but just for the heads up, understand that thirst is not a good indicator of need for hydration in the human body. If you are thirsty, that means you are already dehydrated, and that's even... Uh, you already started to have the adverse effects of dehydration in the body, which, is, which thirst is being one of them. Uh, fuel is, again, nutrition or diet before, during, and after exercise. There are rules, there are guidelines for it, and we are going to cover it again when we cover the energy chapter. And then you need to cycle the volume and intensity of your workouts. If one day is a hard day, the next day should be a, a recovery day or a light day of workouts. And you need to vary the activities and not stick with the same program over and over again. So there is going to be three phases in a workout program, starting with the warm-up. And the goal of the warm-up, I want you to remember these for the test purposes too, and also for your own wellness and health goals in the gym or at home we need to do a, a warm-up at least five minutes to increase muscle temperature uh, which shows uh, less risk of injury into the workout so that we can increase also blood flow to the muscles blood means oxygen oxygen means energy so we need the energy during exercise that therefore we need the blood uh, flowing into the muscles and warm-up is going to provide that. And we need to be doing dynamic stretching, which is basically a movement instead of holding a static stretch. This has been around um, in the recent uh, research, and they already show that doing static stretches in the warm-up will reduce your performance during your, um, your, um, your main event. The second phase of the workout is conditioning, or where you apply the FIT principle, frequency, intensity, time, and type. What, this is the main <clears throat> event in your workout. Whatever you are working for, cardiorespiratory fitness or muscular strength, this is where you will do that work. And then the cool down. This is a gradual decrease in intensity, progressive cooling of your body temperature, but it is really crucial to avoid blood pooling because your body is pumping the blood to your peripheral muscles. Um, and when you stop abruptly, um, there is not going to be enough, there's going to be a delay in, in your body's response to bring back that blood from the periphery to the center. And even though it's, it is rare, it, you know, if you stop abruptly of a very high intensity workout, you might end up um, passing out for a couple seconds. So 
that's called blood pooling. That means your blood stays in the periphery and cannot return back to your center. That's also called venous return, returning um, the blood from the periphery, which is your extremities, your arms and your legs, back to the center, your brain and your heart. And you need to uh, end your workout with static stretches to improve your flexibility. So as a review, um, these are your, in the past we had this pyramid for food. We don't have that anymore. Now we have the pyramid for physical activity. As you look at the top, you need to minimize or totally avoid sedentary activities, uh, watching television, surfing the internet, talking on the phone, which is impossible in this day and age. I understand, but <clears throat> just being aware of it and mindful of of it will increase or will decrease those times that go into the sedentary activities. And then the strength training, two or three non-consecutive days, like we talked about, at least 48 hours between sessions, or also flexibility training. And then the cardiorespiratory endurance being the third level in the pyramid. And the main one is moderate intensity physical activity because again, remember the second slide where I covered all the benefits of being physically active, health benefits. Remember these 120 minutes per week for moderate and 75 minutes per week for vigorous. And if you are looking to lose weight, it's going to be 60 to 90 minutes per day. That's all I'm going to cover for this chapter. Again, I'm going to be available for Zoom meetings if you have any questions. Thank you for listening.